This week on Dialogue, the future of progressive politics. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molesky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Now let's meet our guest. Katrina Vanden Heuvel is editor and publisher of The Nation. She also writes a weekly column for WashingtonPost.com. Her latest book is this one, The Change I Believe In, Fighting for Progress in the Age of Obama. You know, I just wonder about the the title is, uh, were you expecting to fight so hard in the age of Obama, or was the expectation that that might be a little easier? You know, I like that this show is about history as well as international affairs and culture because um, I edit a magazine, The Nation. Some of the columns in this book come from my writing for The Nation, founded in 1865 by abolitionists. The oldest continually published news weekly. You got it, the weekly. oldest continuously published weekly. Um, but, you know, from that perspective, from that stance, uh, fighting for progress, fighting for change is a long struggle in this country. Uh, one of our editorial board members, Eric Foner, the great scholar of Lincoln, wrote a great book about freedom and the idea of the ongoing struggle for freedom. You never stop. And the idea that you just, for example, go to the ballot booth and vote mm, here and now. No. Uh, democracy, not to be over cliched here, is not a spectator sport. I mean, you have to keep working at all levels. Does it concern you that in this uh, sort of culture of immediate gratification that people are losing the ability to stick with the project? Yes and no. I think I have real concerns about our media and how elections are covered, how our democracy is covered. But I also have a belief, particularly sitting here at this moment, that there are people of all ages who are committed to movements. And movements require both short-term victories and long-term patience and strategic thinking. And I've come from New York City. Um, we have seen in these last two months Occupy Wall Street. Sure. There are Occupy encampments in this city and D.C. So you but saw the tents the when you got out of your cab today. I did, and but around the country. And I think that is a testament to people who are saying, enough, we're going to slow down and really take stock of a political system we don't think is working. Talk about that a bit more. What is the, the best evidence that leads to that conclusion? I mean, you've seen, speaking of mainstream media, initially, I was shocked somewhat at how quickly this narrative of dismissiveness took yes, hold. Yes. And now that's begun to change a bit, but with the police crackdown, that's wavering again. How, how do you read what's happening? There are several levels to it, I think most hopefully. I think we've seen in these last two months perhaps the most sustained, in-depth, national conversation in our media about inequality, about fairness, about justice, uh, about holding those corporations accountable for the economic mess we're in. At the same time, we have a media which does like conflict and confrontation. And yes, there has been conflict and confrontation. I would argue that most of the encampments are peaceful associations of people. And in New York City, you saw some paramilitary deployment of police. But um, the key thing to me is you can evict a park, but you can evict an idea, and I hope, and the fight from here on out, talking about a fight, is to keep the issues alive, to keep the issues alive in a media that too often descends into not just quickness, rapidity, but the I infotainment, the sensationalism, right. the... Um, you see it in our coverage of our presidential elections. So much about the personalities. Oh, the horse race versus the, horse the issues. Race, yeah. Well, along those lines, uh, one of the criticisms of Occupy Wall Street has been a, a lack of clarity of message. Uh, you, you don't see it that way. You just outlined what you thought the message was. It's about essentially about economic inequality. I think that they uh, have been, you know, they, people have said they don't have clear demands. Where are the leaders? At the same time, I think there's a moral clarity to the stance of Occupy Wall Street. But I also think what it's done is supercharged and brought into relief those in movements and groups and organizations around this country, in this city, who have been working hard year in, year in, day out, day out over these last years, yeah. and has exposed to me another problem with our corporate mainstream media, which is that for too long in these past two years, I think the media did a disservice to America in portraying a, this country as a one-movement country, just the Tea Party. There are other movements, and so we're seeing them. And I think different occupies around the country come to terms with proposals in different ways. Great proposal out of Occupy DC yesterday 
about a 99 percent deficit reduction plan that the super committee mm -hmm. meeting here is supposed to report next week should take up. So different encampments have different proposals, but at the heart of it, you're right, is this sense of an abiding inequality, a sense that America is not broke, but that the priorities are broken and the need to move from a kind of casino speculative economy into one that is more sustainable and more just. One of the ways you describe in the introduction of the book the, the type of change you believe in is, uh, you d I like this phrase, determined idealism and grounded pragmatism. Want to expand on that, please? You know, I, this is, um, I believe that you need uh, movements from below, that throughout our history, our turbulent history, so much of the change has come from people in motion, the civil rights movement, the labor rights movement. On the other hand, you do need, and this is the pragmatism, you do need politicians inside the system, leaders of conviction, of principle. And it's that fusion, that coalition of change from below, working with those inside to make change. And I think that's a pragmatism that some of my colleagues may not agree with. I think some feel the system is so broken. Tear it all down. Tear it all down. And I believe we have too many destroyers. I'm not talking about my colleagues, but I am talking about those um, who are running for office, who want to run government, but at the same time want to strangle government or drown it in a bathtub, whereas I believe the fight is on for reclaiming a government that is more effective and just, that isn't rigged against ordinary working people, but in fact works on behalf and stands with those people. When you say reclaiming, uh, could you point to a moment in American history where it worked better? Where, yeah, I, I mean, I think in the last 30, 40 years we've seen not only a right wing march through our institutions, but a bipartisan march of money. Mm -hmm. of corrupting, corrupting, corroding money. You also they, write an environment warped by corporate, corporate money. Corporate money. And it's, you know, to a large extent, I would argue that the Republicans are certainly now tapping into that corporate money in m deeper ways. But the Democratic Party, much of it, has also been corroded by the money in the system. And over the last 30 to 40 years, the, the, the lobbyists, the growth of the lobbyist culture, the growth of money in the system, the fact that it takes so much to run an election, I think has kept ordinary people from running and has drowned out the voices of people in favor, in favor of special interests. And that's one reason I think we have a kind of uh, a, a sense of a political system that doesn't work. President Obama, to his credit, wanted to come to Washington and change the culture of Washington. There was a commitment to a different kind of Washington. I think he spoke in ways, and there were such great expectations, he was a Rorschach in some ways, but people heard in that different things. But the fundamental thing I think he confronted was, it's not just partisanship, but it's the, the corruption of a system that isn't working and how you clean that out. To their credit, I think the Democrats, and certainly a lot of movements around this country, progressive movements, have really solid, good ideas for how you could take politics out of, money out of politics. The problem is, that the decent scaffolding of campaign finance reform post Watergate has been really unraveled, both by someone I think is the Darth Vader of campaign finance Who reform, Senator Mitch McConnell of oh. Kentucky, my husband's home state, but also by a Supreme Court. We're mm -hmm. coming on the second Citizens anniversary United. I write about in the change I believe in this Citizens United decision. The, the uh, following this line of, of reasoning of what you describe as really a, a process that's marinated in, in yeah. big money. Uh, is it completely cynical or is it an accurate assessment? To the sort of, I'm thinking of the Ralph Nader worldview, that the parties don't matter anymore. It's a uniparty. They're both funded by the same corporate interests. I know Ralph. Uh, I talked to Ralph Nader. He wrote his first piece for the nation in 1959. I don't buy that because I do think that within the Democratic Party, and I'm not talking Republican now, where I think it's become a more extremist party, which doesn't have room for John Huntsman, for example, or more moderate Republicans. But I think that you have within the Democratic Party, the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party, as the late Senator Paul Wellstone used to describe it, or Howard Dean, a governor of Vermont presidential candidate. So I think you have people inside the Democratic Party, a wing, which is not the establishment wing and not with enough power, which has put out all kinds of common sense, smart proposals to get the money out of the system, to develop a people's budget that counters the one we're arguing about in the city right now, which wouldn't do much to, which would balance the budget on the backs of working people, et cetera. So I don't buy that argument. However, I do buy the need to open up our system, and I got a whole slew of reforms. Um, uh, you need to open up our system so you have more voices in it. And that might mean more parties, but at the moment I think it's very tough to have a strong third party, unless it's a kind of Ross Perot 
top down right. amount of money. If you could fix one thing, either take all the money out of the system or increase voter participation, get numbers that aren't hovering at 50 percent, they're up to 90 percent. Which do you I think, think would have linked. the biggest impact? I think they're linked. I think part of the fact that the money is so powerful leads people to think their voices aren't heard. So if my voice isn't heard, why go? A disincentive. Yeah. To, to and bother. so I think that disconnect mm -hmm. uh, is very, is very strong and needs to be addressed, but it's, it's, it's wound up. I also think media reform. Magazine has done a lot about that. I, a very good government official, Michael Copps, FCC commissioner, mm -hmm. is ending his term at the end of this year. And he would come to our office every few months to talk to us. He's been central to the media democracy efforts. And would say, your first issue could be ending poverty in this country or ending wars we don't need to fight. Your second issue better be the media. Because that's where people are learning about the issues or a media privileging certain views or how they sure. cover it, it an frames issue. Reality. It, just, it, it frames reality. It doesn't just right. frame frames the debate. The it frames reality. And if you don't see alternatives, and that's also part of what my book is about, challenging the parameters of a de debate, which I think is too limited, but to see alternatives, people don't feel they can make a difference or they won't move, well, they won't act. Well, along those lines, from a progressive point of view, uh, would, are the politicians with manipulative messaging more guilty or is it the press that essentially just regurgitates those messages without a lot of critical acuity? Well, part of what's going on, and again, not to just come back to the money, but you know, there is this terrible kind of iron triangle where so much of the campaign costs we see are media costs until we move to a new media and a lot of people are beginning to see the possibility of new media making campaigns less expensive. You've got consultants who are getting a cut. So you have campaigns bought into this. And the scary part, I think, heading into this campaign, John, with the influence of these super PACs and non-disclosure and all this money pouring in, is you may, the media may not play as much of a role as the negative ads or the mm -hmm. advertising which, which right. will come there are a few from studies that show sources. that more people get information about the candidates from, from ads, ads than from news stories so or anything else. The politicians almost become these vehicles. They're not as central. It's like They're these ads. Central casting. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So it's. Uh, I think there's a lot, and I think that's why people are not only in streets and parks and squares, but saying enough. You know, where are our voices? Where are the issues? Majorities of people care about in this country. They want to see it reflected in the media and in a political system and in their communities. I want to do a, a quick tour of the book. A Please, couple of yeah. essays I picked out. I'm going to read to you your own words and have you react to some of these. One is uh, the, the beginning as, essay about a transformational presidency. And you wrote, the great challenge for the nation and other independent and progressive forces is whether we can harness the energy and idealism unleashed by Obama's candidacy and the collapse of conservatism to expand the limits of the current debate. I have two questions about that. Is Were we premature in, in suggesting that conservatism had collapsed? I think conservatism has collapsed because I believe in an intelligent conservatism. I mean, the great philosopher Edmund Burke would be rolling around in his grave if he looked at what we're seeing today because I think it's a right-wing extremism. That so what's collapsed is the conservatism William F. Buckley used to be yes, a poster child well, for. Yes, yeah, much of that. I mean, and or you have, you know, David Brooks or George Will. I mean, I can disagree with much of what they say, but there's a sense of being tethered more to a... Uh, reality. They don't I have forget a what they're talking about. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I think, but, but I also think this Republican Party, you know, it's part of what we've seen over the last 40 years. There is an intent to repeal, roll back the New mm -hmm. Deal, but to go beyond that. And, and then this part that, the, about the great challenge for the nation and other sources or independent sources. Uh, has, has it more than Obama who has dropped the ball? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, in fact, I think, again, if you believe that change comes about from both the movement outside and a people of principle inside. I think after Obama was elected, there were many good groups, but who suspended some of the tougher independent organizing that is always needed to push a president. Complacency? No, a belief that, um, you know, maybe certainly coming out of eight years of Bush Cheney, hey, well, you know, we're in such a good place now. Let's, let's give space. Let's, let's trust. And I think you don't want to be in a bickering situation but you can't trust you got to keep moving and pushing and doing so in a way that's constructive um, but I also think President Obama came in the gr expectations were so great and who knew in addition to everything else that you would confront a Republican Party whose two leaders Mitch McConnell and Jim DeMint made it very clear that their priority was not to govern One -term but presidency. to bring down mm -hmm. a president so. but, but you did mention uh, that uh, 
Obama was a Rorschach test of sorts. Yes, and then yes. you have the essay, How Audacious Will Obama Choose to Be? The Fate of an Obama Presidency Mel well may be determined by that. How and, and has he been misunderstood by his followers? Is this a man who is essentially one of the centrists we hear about, but has been characterized by the other side as a liberal demon? I think, you know, he, he, he himself said, by the way, during the campaign that he was a Rorschach. And, you know, I sit with people and they say, you know, he was going to take him out. We, how did, why did he escalate in Afghanistan? I said, did you listen to him during the campaign? He talked about Iraq, the need to get out of Iraq, and then the mindset. But he talked about Afghanistan as the good war. I think he's a progressive pragmatist or a pragmatic progressive. I don't believe in labels, but if I had to put one on him, I would put that on him. So I think, as again with any president, including De Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who is the hero to so many progressive liberals, he came to office as a deficit-reducing governor of New York. It took a lot of ongoing motion and pressure to build the New Deal as we saw it. It also required a different lay of the land. You can't be naive. America is a different country today. The labor movement is weaker than it was under Roosevelt. They're, it's a globalized economy. We're confronting possibly a global recession. When you, when you look out at Europe and you see the austerity measures there, you have to respect, however undersized it was, the stimulus measures President Obama took, though he didn't sell it well, and the other important well, pieces of legislation some didn't go far enough. Didn't go far enough. Health care and the financial reform bill, two major pieces of legislation, did not go far enough. You can argue it was President Obama's leadership. You can argue it was the lobbyists' money diluting, gutting those pieces of legislation. You can, or, you know, or could you argue that it's the nation is not that progressive? There's a certain conservative impulse that worries about things like so-called government takeovers. You know, I think this is. I don't think this is a center-right country. When you look at so many of the surveys, people at this moment want jobs, not cuts. They're more interested in job creation as the best way of deficit reduction, not cuts to Social Security, Medicare, et cetera. However, mm -hmm. I do think that it's not just the right-wing assault on government over these last 30, 40 years, but the fact that government hasn't worked well for ordinary people. I mean, wages have stagnated for working people. The sense that government is rigged against you is very endemic and very deep. So that has worked against, I think, a president coming in and trying to use government, even for measures we might argue aren't as bold, but they are bold. So I think that is a lot of work that progressives and people who care about this country need to do. You know, if you were to land here in your spacecraft from another planet and just Sometimes look at it. <laughs> I wanted of that. to send an no. anthropologist to Washington <laughs> one year to cover it. <laughs> well, you know, if you look at it, some of the superficial rates, you look at public opinion polling on individual issues, you look at the, the demographics of the nation, what you seem to see is a lot of the pieces in play for major progressive movements. Yes. So what, well, what happened is... on the way to Washington? Again, the, I, you know, there is majority support right now for ending the war in Afghanistan. There is majority support for Social Security and Medicare. It's a radical disconnect in this Majority country. support for tax increases. For tax increases. Why don't we see that played out here? This is the big question of questions. And again, I think some of it, has to, it comes back to the fact that we're not hearing people's voices in this city in ways we need to. Not to be too reductionist, but it is, it is a function of money to a large extent that you have these outsized, outsized interests. And of course you have regional factors. And I think again, you, there, is, there needs to be serious consideration about maybe within each party, you have two parties. Maybe within the Republican Party, though less so there, but in the Democratic Party, there needs to be rethinking. It, because at that party, the Democratic Party, has been such an umbrella over these years that maybe You're that's not about working. Also more parliamentarian, our, our parliamentary system, where in, in representative. Book, yeah, uh, I mean, in my book, I talk about all kinds of reforms. I get wonky, but you know, how do you reform the reform the electoral college? How do you begin a system that has been in play in cities around this country, proportional representation, so that you have the possibility of more voices being heard? Because this is a great land with many divor diverse voices, but you don't hear as many of them. The media plays a role too. And now I think you, um, you'll see more of a chill effect.
one need money. Sorry, excuse me, Katrina, sorry to step on your last word there. One of the concerns that you hear from uh, thinking Republicans and Democrats is that we've moved into sort of this post-fact environment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you have a, an essay in here, Conservative Zealotry versus Economic Reality, where you write, one thing about the current generation of conservatives, getting mugged by reality hasn't changed the way they look at the world. Then you go on to say, though, but neither Greenspan nor conservatives nor, tragically, Obama are about to let reality get in the way of ideology. What happened to us? You know, um, again, there, I was meeting with our nation interns yesterday. They're a great group. By the way, two of them now run England. Edward Miliband is head of the Labour Party. Nicholas Clegg is deputy prime minister of the UK. But one of them had an important piece about Occupy Econ 101. And I'm serious. So in the economics departments in colleges, universities across this country, People are no longer studying Keynes. They're no longer studying alternative economics in the way that they need to. They're studying neoclassical consensus, kind of austerity economics at a time when you need an alternative. So I would argue that you're, 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 um, it's not so much post-truth in this area on the economic front. I think we're living in a post-truth environment on climate science, on the birther scandal with Obama. But on this front, it is the fact that we have cut out alternatives to a kind of consensual economic Washington consensus, which you've heard expressed, which no longer works. It's been discredited in fundamental ways, but it lives on as if it's like the zombie economics. Is this the success of political messaging and framing the message and creating the narrative? And also, does it also speak the other side of that coin of the failure to the media to vet these messages? I think it speaks to the, of the failure of the media to give voice to alternatives to alternative thinking about alternative economics. But this, again, I think is a great crossroads moment. Inequality, I mean, the nation is, these are issues we've been championing or looking at for years. We did a special issue on inequality three years ago. But this is a moment now for a country to look into itself and ask, why do we have gilded age inequality? What, do, what does that mean? How dangerous is that to this country? What are we, a republic or an empire? How do we build a fairer country? And in those questions, maybe a media will pay attention to voices that hadn't been heard from before. And a political system needs to be shamed and engaged and challenged and taken on so that it opens up to ideas it has been shut down to. What do you expect? And elections play a role. Well, I was going to ask about elections. What do you expect the electorate to do next time around? Are we into this topsy-turvy period where we're going to just keep switching yeah. by huge yeah. numbers every time out? Let's, you know, I, let's begin from the top because so much of our system is about the presidential, and mm -hmm. that's what we have in tw 2012. You know, it's brutal to be a candidate for president with 9, 9.5% unemployment. The history shows that. Very tough, especially even for an incumbent president. Um, I think 2010 was not a mandate for the Tea Party. I think we've seen that in the overreach. We've seen that in the repudiation in Ohio, et cetera, in these last few days, weeks. But it was more like throw the bums out and the lousy economy. I'm more hopeful at the state and local congressional levels that you will have a, a sense of these issues we've talked about playing a role and tethering a Tea Party that has overreached and moving that out of the equation. Um, I think the Tea Party may have found its high point, and I may be wrong. And so where it goes from here, it opens up possibilities, not just for progressives, but for common sense, evidence-based kind of candidates. Do you believe that the Republican leadership, I think of John Boehner, you've already said what you think about Mitch McConnell, but in John Boehner's case, would he be a different Speaker of the House without the Tea Party tugging at him? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, the, the Tea Party has hijacked the Republican Party. And, you know, I respect people with passion and strong convictions. I think the Tea Party uh, is out of sync. I really do, is out of sync with the country. Uh, it is a mi minority. It's like a sort of, it's sort of like the Menshevik Bolshevik party. I mean, it's really well. I sort of think of it as America that has built its credibility on being the country of the future has a movement that's all regressive. It so all wants true. to look back I think, for answers. I think so much of the Tea Party is about a, a people who are nostalgic for a country they believe they once lived in, seeing a country go undergoing such rapid demographic shifts, economic shifts. 
and not knowing where they fit in in that and in there not knowing they're going to clamp down they're going to get disciplined and they're going to stop progress that is part of why i called the subtitle of this book is fighting for progress mm -hmm. because we are a changing country and we need to find ways to be inclusive and open to that the tea party let me ask you, uh, we only have a couple minutes remaining, but we've talked about the, uh, the state of the nation large. How about the state of the nation, the magazine? How are you doing? The, it's a tough environment for print publications. It's a tough environment, but, you know, we are now kind of, you know, a media enterprise. I mean, someone just said to me at Union Station, I just subscribed to the nation on the iPhone, you know, on his the iPhone. Electronic version, yeah, so we version, have apps. Yeah. We're on every device available to humankind. But we also value uh, the web. If you have, we've always had a different business model of the nation, has advertising is our third revenue stream. We have 30,000 nation associates who give a little each month, and we um, believe in quality journalism. We are sustainable, but we invest the little we make back into our journalism, and we are nurturing a new generation of both great investigative journalists, analytical, interpretive reporters, and I think it's a great moment for us. I mean, it's the former editor of the nation, Victor Navasky, a great editor, had a line which I don't love, but what's bad for the nation is good for the nation. So George W. Bush tripled our circulation. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, but I well, someday am working toward what's good for the Fox nation News is good is for the nation. And Fox News is under President under Obama. President Obama. Yeah, it yeah. works both ways. But the movement energy right now is very exciting for our readers, and they're connecting to that. Final quick thought with less than a minute. I just want to ask you about the very interesting essay you end on, Rising to the Task of Slowing Down. Yeah. How are you doing? I know you had to it's rush over here. It's <laughs> and aspirational. It's aspirational. I mean, I, I be, but, you know, I believe we talked earlier about attention deficit disorder, everything moving so quickly. Mm -hmm. The ability to find time to reflect. Um, I believe that among a younger generation, as well as all of us, people are realizing that we're not being served well by everything speeding up. So I write this column every summer. How to slow down, and I uh, and try bow to, live by to it find the rest of the year. behind you, <laughs> but that's uh, part of fighting for progress <laughs> in well, any age. Thank you for joining us thank today. You. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. The, the book is "The Change I Believe in," Katrina Vanden Heuvel. Uh, we'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.